Well, good morning. We are glad you're here today. Got a couple quick announcements before we jump in. The first one is we are starting our outdoor services uh, through the summer and the fall. We'll have one outdoor service every month and it'll be the first Sunday of each month. So our first outdoor service will be next Sunday. Uh, so we'll be outside next Sunday and then if the weather's bad, we'll just come in. It'll be underneath the uh, pavilion over there. And so uh, we wanted to continue doing that this year. Uh, second is this week we have Bible study. Uh, but no tween group. There's Bible study on Wednesday. And the third one is something I'm super excited about. On June 26th, we're going to have a night of prayer for the underground church. Now, you may not know what the underground church is. Uh, it's a church that has to meet in hiding and in secret because there is heavy persecution in their country. And so what we'll do on that night is we'll pray and we'll also have a documentary that we'll watch. I have a quick preview of this documentary so you can kind of understand the weight of, of what we're going to look at. So Austin, if you want to play that, that video real quick, it'd be great. One of the biggest things that maybe working in the persecuted church has made me think about is what is my price? Where or what my price? Is money my price? Is the ones that I love my price? Is my uh, friends my price? Is the ministry at large my price? What's your price? So the question that they answer in the documentary is, what is the price you're willing to pay to follow Jesus? And in the Middle East, it's often your life and many other things. And so we're going to take a look at that on June 26th. What we'll do is we'll watch pieces of the documentary and then take time to pray for the underground church. I think this could possibly be a really big event. So we're going to advertise it on Facebook to different churches and on uh, websites and, and stuff like that. Uh, so I just want to give you a heads up about that. You'll get more information as it gets closer. Uh, but we're really excited about that. All right, before we jump into the text, let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you for your grace, especially for us right here, right now, when we don't have to hide when we meet, when we can just openly come together, and so we thank you for that. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work inside of us, and that it will convict us and make us feel uncomfortable, because when we feel uncomfortable, we have a choice to change. So I pray that you do that today through this text and through the word. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we just finished up our series on discipleship, and two weeks from now, we're starting a new series on the book of Philippians. So over the next two weeks, I would encourage you to take time to read that book. It's only four chapters long, real short, real easy to get through. But it, over the next two weeks here, we kind of have two off weeks or weeks where we kind of are just preaching on, on what we want. And so what I'm actually going to preach on is a text that I preach at least, well, I preach once a year in church here. Every year I have preached this text. You may say, Brett, is it because you're lazy? Or Brett, is it because you don't know what else to talk about? Yes. <laughs> Definitely not. Just kidding. Uh, it's not because I'm lazy. It's not because I don't know what to talk about. It's because I feel in this text, we see two things super clearly. We see, one, what Jesus came to do. And number two, we see what it looks like to actually love like Jesus. Not love like we think we should, but actually, what does it look like to love like Jesus? And I think this is something that we need to be reminded of every year. And it's going to be different than the past three times I've preached it, or the past two times I've preached it. But I think it's so important to us and so essential to us, so I come to this text once a year. On the end, at the end, what I think we'll see, like I said, is that we'll see who Jesus is and what his mission was and what it looks like to love people. And so instead of having some cute story to start off with, let's just jump right into the text. We're going to be in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 36. Since I know this text very well and I've preached it, Many a times, whenever I travel, I also preach this text. Uh, I know the text very well. I decided to study the context around it. And what I found as I was reading chapter 7, what I seen is every person within chapter 7 was asking, Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? From the, from the servant who got, healed, who got healed to the uh, woman whose son was raised to John the Baptist, they were all trying to figure out who Jesus is. And chapter 7 kind of finishes up by defining exactly who Jesus is. So we're going to start in uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 36. 
It says this. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. All right, so most of us know who a Pharisee is. They were a religious leader of the time. Uh, they were kind of like a pastor, but the truth is they were more educated. They uh, didn't just go to Bible school or seminary. They weren't just trained at home. Like They went to school for years and years and years, 10 to 20 plus years. And so they were very educated, but they were also very self-righteous. They thought that they were better than the people around them. Uh, one thing that they thought is they thought they had a secret law from God. So in the book of Exodus, when Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, he was up there for, for 40 days. In between that time, he got the Ten Commandments and the six, 616 other commandments we see in the Bible. The Pharisees actually thought that Moses also got some secret commandments. So Moses brought those down, passed those on to people, so secret select people, and they kept passing and passing and passing it along until it got to the Pharisees. So because of that, the Pharisees would often make up laws and make up rules to kind of fit their agenda, to kind of fit what they thought would happen. And so the Pharisees are often thought of as almost the enemies of Jesus. Like when, when we see a Pharisee, we often think of them as like they're, they're going against what Jesus says. And here's the beautiful thing. I think in the 21st century, we would do well to hear this. How did Jesus make war against his enemies? Did he make war against his enemies? By blocking them on Facebook? Did he make war against his enemies by canceling their TV show? Did he make war against their enemies by talking about them behind their back? Did he make uh, war against his enemies by trying to fight them? No, what did he do? He went to the house of his enemies and ate lunch with them. That is totally different than what we think in the 21st century. We think we must wake war against our enemies by physically fighting or emotionally fighting against them. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus literally wants, and to reach his enemies, he wants, and he ate a meal with them. Totally counterculture to what we think we should do. And so Jesus is at the Pharisee's house. He's eating a meal with them. And then it says this in verse 37. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair on her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now, what we see here is this woman who we don't know much about, except she's defined as the town sinner woman. Uh, may have been a prostitute, we're not exactly sure, but we know that the town sinner as a sinner woman comes and washes the feet of Jesus. Now, this is me using my imagination. This is me using a little conjecture. It doesn't say this exactly in the Bible. What I kind of imagine is that this woman sees Jesus come into town. And she's excited because she knows that Jesus goes and hangs out with the tax collectors, hangs out with the most broken. But instead, Jesus goes to the house of the Pharisee. And this woman wants to see Jesus and wants to meet Jesus, but she can't go in that house. Because if she goes in the house, the Pharisees will judge her. Matter of fact, the Pharisees might not even let her in the house if, uh, if she tried. And so I just imagine her walking up and down the street trying to decide if she should go in. And finally, in a moment of excitement and just pure adrenaline, she runs into the room. And she starts washing the feet of Jesus with her tears. And she starts washing the feet of Jesus with her hair and the special ointment that she brought. Now, some things are weird in the Bible because culturally we don't understand what's going on. But other things are weird in the Bible just because they're weird. And this is the second. This is the latter. This is weird just because it's weird. Just imagine it like this. Imagine that Steve Cagle is, is preaching next week. Which shouldn't be hard because, because he is preaching next week. And then all of a sudden... A woman busts in through the back door, comes off, and takes his little shoes off his little feet. I always say that because I wear a size 15, and he's kind of embarrassed right now, but that's okay. Uh, and, so they, and she starts rubbing the feet, Steve's feet. Um, first, Bobby's going to be like, uh-uh, it's going to come up and take care of her. You need to find uh, somebody else's name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep using you. You're the only one who won't get mad at me. Uh, so, but imagine that happened. We would feel awkward. It would be weird. Everyone in the room would be like, what is going on? That is the same thing that is happening in this story. Jesus is sitting there, probably talking, probably even teaching. And this woman just busts in and is crying and is emotional and is using her tears and her hair to watch Jesus' feet. And what is, is even weirder is their feet were disgusting. Like, it's not like our feet who had shoes. They, they didn't have shoes back then. And they walked on dirt roads. You know what else walked on dirt roads? Donkeys and horses and mules. And you know what donkeys do when they walk? What do they do, Bob? Hee-haw. Yeah, they hee-haw. And 
They also, they also go to the bathroom everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the people in the Middle East would be walking on these dirt roads and their feet would be disgusted, covered in poop and urine and all this stuff. And this woman is like, I'm coming in and I'm washing your feet, Jesus. Your dirty, nasty, disgusting feet, I'm going to wash. Now, how do the Pharisees respond? Let's see in verse 39 here. Now, the Pharisee who had invited him over saw this. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered, said, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. So this Pharisee who invited Jesus over is thinking, if he knew who this woman was, if he knew that this was the town sinner woman, if he knew that this was possibly the, the town prostitute, he would not let her touch him. He would not let her touch him. And then Jesus, being God who can read minds, reads the mind of the Pharisee and says, Hey, Simon, I got a story to tell you. Listen up. And so he tells a story. He tells a parable. A parable is this. It's a short story with a singular point and the main character is God. When we're talking about parable, is a short story with a singular point and the main character is always God. And so in this parable, he says this. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose of whom you canceled the larger debt. And he said, you're right. Or he says, you have judged rightly. And so two people owe money. One's 50 denarii, one's 500 denarii. In modern day terms, that'd be like two months worth of wages versus like 20 months worth of wages. So if someone owed people money, someone owed about maybe $5,000 and the other person owed $50,000, and they forgave both debts, which one's going to be more excited? Probably the $50,000 guy, right? He's going to be, yeah, I'm $50,000 uh, free. And then it says this in verse 44. Then turning towards the woman, I love that he turned and he looked at the woman while talking to Simon. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her, with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she has loved much, but he who has forgiven little loves little. And so there's a co comparison and contrast going on here. They're comparing Simon to the sinner woman, the Pharisee to the sinner woman. The si Simon brought no water, but the sinner woman washed Jesus' feet with her tears. Simon didn't kiss Jesus, but the sinner woman could not quit kissing his feet. Simon didn't bring any oil, but the sinner woman used fancy ointment and oil to wash Jesus' feet. Because she realizes her sin, because she realizes who she is, she realizes the forgiveness that Jesus can offer. And what Jesus is going to do is say the most shocking thing in the text, more shocking to a first century Pharisee than this woman coming in and washing the feet, he's going to say something super shocking. He says this in verse 48. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And so what Jesus does, he answers the question that all of Luke chapter 7 has been trying to answer. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? He's the one who comes and forgives sin. To us, we understand that. But to a first century Pharisee, to hear that, that Jesus forgives sin is to say that Jesus is God. And they couldn't comprehend or understand that. And so Jesus here, we see clearly that he's the one who comes to forgive sin. Now what I'm going to do now with the rest of our time is I want to give us five or four applications. I did have five, but I decided to cut it down to four. Four applications uh, for today coming out of this text. The first one is this. First application is this. You are the sinner woman. Austin, if you could go to the slide and follow along with the applications. Awesome. You are the sinner woman. One of the worst things we can do with the Bible is, hear me on this, please listen. One of the worst things you can do is make yourself the hero of every single story in the Bible. So often when we read the Bible, we make ourselves the hero of the story. What I love about this story is you can't make yourself the hero unless you're willing to call yourself Jesus. But we make ourselves the hero. We become David slaying Goliath, and we become Daniel in the lion's den, and we become Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And we become the hero of the story. Not that we don't do these things, but our life doesn't always point to that. Our life isn't always us being the hero. What you do when you make yourself always the hero of the Bible is you take the place of Jesus 
what was only meant for Jesus and you say, look at me. Look at how awesome I am. Look at how great I am. The Bible is supposed to meant to, to point to Jesus, not point to you, not point to how great you are, but point to how great Jesus is. And so that's what I love about this story. Like, we can't be Jesus in the Bible. We can't be the one offering forgiveness. However, what we can be is we can be the sinner woman. And that's awesome because God doesn't save the greats. He saves the broken. He saves those who realize they're sinful. He saves those who do not deserve it. You may say that I am not the sinner woman. Like, my life isn't like that. Uh, I'd say two things. Number one, okay, then you're the Pharisee in the story. Uh, you think you're better than people. Or this. If we really looked at your life and you looked at your heart, you would see that you do in some ways emulate the sinner woman. I used this illustration before and I used it in Twin Group last week and everyone got red faced. Let's say that I happen to be able to go up to your brain and take the five worst thoughts you've ever had. The five worst thoughts you've ever had. Put those thoughts onto my phone, plug that phone into this projector right here and show it to everyone in the room. Who in here would stay in the room and sit and watch that with everyone? No, we would be running out of this room super embarrassed and super ashamed of, of what we thought. Probably there's a thought you had this week that if I put on the projector and I showed everyone, you would go running out of this room, right? We're, we're not as great as we, we think we are. We see that we're liars and we're thieves and at hearts we're murderers and adulterers. If you're not processing that, that's okay. That's just what Jesus says. And even if we do everything right and good, and even if we are 100% perfect in our actions, which none of us are, and we're more like the Pharisee, our motives are often off. We do good things for bad reasons and bad things for good reasons. It's often because we want people to see us and we want people to like us. A lot of times when we do good things, it's because we want other people's attention instead of doing it for the purposes of, of God. I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago. I was sitting around with a bunch of Christians and then all of a sudden, they started talking about like, all these awesome things they did. And I don't want to judge their motives. I, I don't know for sure. But it sounded like a lot of us were out there to try to say, hey, here's what I've done. So the name of Jesus was barely ever said. Often, when we come together as Christians, what we do is we talk about how great we are and all the great things we've done. And what I would argue is that, that makes us the sinner woman as well. The common misconception is that at our core and at our heart, that we're actually good people. But the truth is we're not. From our birth, our heart is centered on doing what we want when we want. Uh, Steve talked about this a couple weeks ago with toddlers, right? If you have toddlers, you know they're some of the most self-centered things you've ever been around in your life, right? <laughs> and uh, even more so with babies, right? Like, I was thinking about this today. I have never been laying down at 3 o'clock in the morning then just started yelling, turned over to my wife and said, hey, I want a sandwich, go make me one. But babies do that every night when they want to eat, right? They just start yelling, they're like, give me food. We, those of us who have had kids understand that. Uh, I have never been sitting on the couch watching TV with my wife and started yelling because I want her to flip me from my left side to my right, right? I do that on my own. Uh, I've never been in the car on a two-hour drive and started yelling at the top of my lungs because I wanted out of the car until the car stopped, right? <laughs> now, babies can't do those things on their, on their own, and I know it's kind of funny and silly, uh, but the truth is, is they think life's all about them. And the truth is, is that most of us never grow out of that. We continue to think that we are the center of the universe and that life is about us. The truth is, if you're in church, or if you're not in church, you are the center woman. Even if you've been to church your whole life and grown up in church and was born onto the altar, you are the sinner woman. In your heart, deep down, once we get to your motives and we see who you really are, you are filled with sin. It's not just that we're bad and we need a sprinkle of Jesus. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we're in desperate need of him. So that's application point number one. Uh, maybe I should stop there. If I did, there would be no hope. Application point number two is this, that God's grace is more. That even though we are the sinner woman, God's grace is so much more than that sin in our life. I'll go here. Let's go with this illustration. Um, let's say, um, I think a lot of us look at Jesus like this. Like we were walking, and as we were walking, we fell into like a little, little uh, hole or something. And there's buddy Jesus to grab us out of the hole and put, a, put his shoulder around us. We have a little sin, and we had a little problem, and Jesus helped us out. Now, there's some truth in that, but the better analogy or the better illustration would be this. 
that you were looking off a 10,000 foot cliff and you thought to yourself, I can make this jump. So you jump off a 10,000 foot cliff and you fall straight to the ground and you smack like a pancake on the ground. And then here comes Jesus. He climbs down the canyon, climbs down the cliff, and he breathes life right into you. And then he puts you on his shoulder and climbs back up that cliff and sets you on the ground right there. And you look at him and you say, thank you. And then you jump off the cliff again. And you do it again. And Jesus comes down and breathes life into you. And then carries you back up the cliff. And you're like, thank you. And maybe you take a couple steps this way. And then you jump off the cliff again. The truth is that time and time again, God's grace is in your life. His grace is so much more than your sin. And we see this most clearly in the story of the gospel, right? That where you lied and stole and hated and had hatred and murder and sin in your heart, Jesus didn't. He was 100% good and he loved people all the time. And he laid down his life for you. He was placed on the cross. And while he was on the cross, the sins of the world were placed upon him. And he wasn't just, he just didn't die on the cross. He was punished in your place. He took that sin, the wrath that you deserve from God for your sin, and he died and he rose from the grave, defeating sin and defeating death. It's not just that he died for sin, that he became sin on your behalf. And when you could not reach up to God, he reached down to you in the form of Jesus. And so while our sin is great, God's grace is so much more. God's love for you is not based on what you've done or how great you are, but it's based on what Jesus has done for you. And if that truth doesn't rock you every time you hear it, I'd say maybe open your ears a little bit. God's love for you is not based on what you've done, but it's based on what Jesus has done for you. His grace is so great. All right, here's the point I've been worrying about. Application point number three here uh, is that God's love is for all people. Now, usually when I go to this point, what I'll talk about is how like God loves the most broken, right? And God loves the prostitutes and, and those who are stuck in deep, deep sin. And what I'm coming to realize is most Christians understand that. And they sympathize and even often have empathy for people in those situations, right? I've told this story before, and it always gets a couple laughs. It's the guy who comes up on stage and sings, God got the whole world in his hands. And he talks about God got the babies in his hands and, and the elderly in his hands. And then he goes into three more choruses, and he says, God got the, the prostitutes and, and the crack drug addicted and, and those who are really broken in his hands. And, and everyone laughs, and it's funny, and it's true, right? God got those people in his hands. But like I said, the more I'm around Christians, the more I realize that that's not often something that we don't understand. Maybe it is, but for most of us, it's not. I think what we need to hear more is that God got the far right in his hand and loves them, and God loves the far left as well. I'm going to say this too, and this will get a lot of flack, culturally speaking, but God loves the racists, and God also loves the leader of Black Lives Matters. He loves them the same and loves them as much as you. And here, here's a big one here. God loves Donald Trump and he also loves Joe Biden. And he loves them the same. And he loves them the same that he loves you. That is controversial and that is hard to hear, but that is 100% the truth. I watched this video this past week and it just broke my heart. There was this guy who was blatantly racist, 100% racist. He was 100% in the wrong and it wasn't around here. And then all I've seen were people attacking him and his comments and, and saying that he deserves to go to hell and that, that he's just a horrible, horrible person. Right? He is, right? But don't you understand that God loves that person and God loves you as well? Just because someone sins differently than you doesn't mean that God doesn't love them the same that he loves you. Amen. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's good. That's good because if your God always makes you feel comfortable then you don't have the God of the Bible. You have a God that fits your desires and fits exactly what you want. If that makes you feel uncomfortable, that's good because it makes me feel uncomfortable. Because there's not many things I dislike more than a racist. But to understand that God loves them in the same way that he loves me, and he wants them to repent and trust in Jesus in the same way he wants me to repent and trust in Jesus, it just changes my life and changes my heart. What is wrong of us to do is to go around and defame people's name, to call someone Sleepy Joe, or to call someone the Orange Man. Both, both of those are wrong, because God loves those people. And we're taking someone who was made in the image of God, who God loves and wants to repent, and we're condemning them. What Jesus, not, not saying that you can't disagree with certain people. I'm not saying that you shouldn't stand up and say what is right and what is wrong. 
But what I am saying, if your only reason to, to talk about people is to condemn them, that's, that's not the heart of Jesus. What did Jesus do with his enemies? He invited them to the table. He had dinner with them. If all we're going to do is make war by fighting on Facebook about who our favorite politician is, we're, we're doing it wrong. We're fighting the wrong battle. We're, we're sleeping. Okay? God loves all people. God loves the broken, and he loves those who we disagree with. Application point number four is this. Following Jesus may make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. Not only may, may make you, it will make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. Now, I've been watching these documentaries on the church in the Middle East, man, and it's how you hear their stories. Like, you just don't understand what real persecution is. It's like crazy. Like, they have conversations with their spouses and with their friends. What do you want me to do if or when the government comes in and starts beating you and wants me to renounce the name of Jesus. Like, do you want me to do that? Or do you want me to let them kill you? And they have to have actual conversations about that. And that is crazy and nuts to me. Uh, that's real persecution. And that's really being uncomfortable, right? Like, like, that's real uncomfort. However, here in America, we also feel uncomfortable sometimes too when it comes to following Jesus. Sometimes we feel uncomfortable because we have to not go out and do something with some friends and they make fun of us for it. Or, or maybe we feel uncomfortable because we know we should tell this person about Jesus and the Holy Spirit's really pushing on us, but we're like, I can't do that. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Or maybe we have to give up some popularity. The truth is, is that following Jesus is not always about being comfortable, but it's about following after what he calls you to do. I think about this with the sinner woman, right? Like, imagine how uncomfortable it was for her to walk into a house of people who she knew was going to judge them. Like, how uncomfortable do you think she felt inside? Extremely uncomfortable. But she knew that Jesus was worth it. And that being in the presence and following after Jesus was worth it. We often view church like going to the movie theaters. It's like, we come into church and we're following Jesus. We get our popcorn and we sit down and we listen and we feel entertained, right? And that's often how church is described, or how we, how we do church. But it's more like going into the army. It's like we come in here, we get pushed, we get changed, we get developed, we worship God, and then we go out and we go on mission. And that's really what church is. It's not about feeling comfortable, but it's about being changed by the Spirit to follow after God. And so the four application points were this. You are the sinner woman. Despite that, God's grace is more than your sin. God loves all people, not just people like you. And following Jesus may make you feel uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, how we're going to end here is uh, I'm not going to have any questions for you. Uh, what I did want to do is have a time of, of reflection. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play one of my, my favorite songs, actually. It's called Mercy is More. And uh, we're probably going to get shut off on Facebook. So if you're listening on Facebook, just know that you're probably going to get muted for a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to play this song. What I want you to do is just listen to the lyrics. Listen to uh, how our sin is so great, but God's mercy is so much more. And, and uh, just kind of think back on your sin and the grace that God has given you. And then what I want you to do is kind of reflect and think, what is God calling you to do after this sermon? Not just walk out of here, but what is God calling you to apply to your life? So this is about a four or five minute song. Take time to just kind of reflect and pray, and then I'll come back up and close this out. I hope you were able to reflect, and then even if you were able to talk to the people around you about what's going on, that's great. Um, I love this story, man. And if this could be the DNA of who we were, are as a church, I, mean, I just think the world would change around us. If we could understand the forgiveness that God has given us and the love that he calls us to love the people around us, I think our families would change, our communities would change, and the world would change. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. God, we love you. That We thank you that you love us, even though we don't deserve it, even though we're so broken sometimes, and our hearts are so far away from you. Lord, you love us, and you take us, and you bring us in, and you make us your child. And we thank you for that. And through the death of Jesus, you do that. We pray that we just comprehend that deep down in our soul, and that would push us to follow after you. That would push us into change, and following after you. I pray that if anyone felt uncomfortable today, that they would push into that and that the Holy Spirit would push back and show them where things need to change and show them where, where they need to become more like Jesus. Lord, I pray in my own life where I was even feeling uncomfortable about things I was, I was saying, Lord, that you changed that in me and that I just love you more than anything else. Lord, we thank you for what you do. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.